Hello, my dear listeners and viewers from YouTube channel Juggler66. Today I am here to read another chapter of the book Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow. I have arrived now at chapter 10 and that means that we are in the half of the book, which is 156 pages and I'm on page 69 in the PDF. And the chapter is called Was Peter the First Pope? After all that we have read before, when you have followed these, and after everything we read after these, <laughs> we can really come to the conclusion that Peter was not the first Pope. Just to take a little bit of the interest maybe away, <laughs> tell it from the beginning like it is. <clears throat> anyway, we start reading. In chapter 10 was Peter the first Pope. Standing at the head of the Roman Catholic Church is the Pope of Rome. This man, according to Catholic doctrine, is the earthly head of the Church and successor of the Apostle Peter. Now, I have to make a little comment already right here, after the very first sentence. Oh, exactly or two sentences, <laughs> right from the beginning. I'm going to read to you a little excerpt that you've maybe heard when you follow my reading on Rulers of Evil, that is now closed, uh, because I read the complete book, and you can find that in the playlist Rulers of Evil. Um, there will be made an epilogue later on, but I don't have time right now because I'm busy with doing the German reading of Rulers of Evil as far as my brother in Christ Andreas gets the translation on the way as he well did up to 17 chapters and I'd done three readings but that's in German anyway from the book Rulers of Evil we read on page 285 listen quote since the epoch of Emperor Constantine the Roman papacy has fostered the concept that the ruler who terrorizes wrongdoers is necessarily a Christian. Pope Sylvester, the Bishop of Rome, who supposedly converted Constantine to Christianity, saw nothing strange in a warrior coming to faith in a crucified Christ by slaughtering his enemies. This thinking pervaded Sylvester's successors, as well as the Crusades, the Holy Roman Empire, the European nationalism, the American Revolution, the War of Southern Secession, and the Wars of the 20th century. Indeed, perhaps the Black Papacy's most admirable psychological conquest is that Protestants generally agree that armed rulership is an authority instituted by God for Christians to exercise. Since there is no scriptural authority for a member of the body of Christ to bear any kind of armament whatsoever other than the figurative weaponry of God's word, agreeing to such a principle signifies prima facie, adherence to the moral guidance of him who bears the power of Almighty God on earth, the person who legitimately bears the mark of Cain in a long succession begun with Peter. Yes, the popes can truthfully declare that Peter is their foundation. By holding in mental reservation that the Hebrew DJR, which is pronounced Peter, means firstling, which of course is Cain's primary attribute as firstborn of Eve. I'm going to repeat that last sentence that you well understand the meaning of the whole reading I did from Rulers of Evil. Yes, the popes can truthfully declare that Peter is their foundation by holding in mental reservation that the Hebrew jeer pronounced Peter means firstling. Peter means Peter means firstling, which of course is Cain's primary attribute as firstborn of Eve. So the Pope is the successor of the firstborn of Eve, Cain, the very first person born into this earth with the knowledge of good and evil from the beginning because of the sin of his mother and father 
of eating of the forbidden fruit in the garden. The pomegranate, the apple that was lifted to them. That was a pomegranate you can read and study when you listen to or when you read Alexander Hislop's Two Babylons. That is the Peter that the Roman Catholic Church actually depends on when they go about their traditions that they are the successor of Peter. They are the successor of the firstborn of Eve, of Cain. And that means that they have the mark of Cain. And when you know what that entails, then please watch the documentaries from Walter Veit, where he does not go into any teachings of Ellen G. White. This is why I really say, listen to these. There's the Mark of Cain, and there's the Herodian Mind, part 1 and 2. These are wonderful lectures that he did, explaining the Mark of Cain, and explaining where all the evil rulers in this world come from. You combine that knowledge that Walter Feit tells you in these lectures, together with the reading of Rulers of Evil, and you get a very well understanding about governing bodies and why governments are the way they are today. But okay, gonna continue. And by the way, this is a short, a short, <laughs> short. This is a short chapter. So sometimes I combine two chapters when they are not too long. Uh, normally I would do this with chapter ten also, but chapter eleven is quite deep and long, so I will not do this and just read chapter 10. Was Peter the first Pope? Which we already answered a little bit within the first seven minutes of the video. But anyway, the author continues, according to this belief, meaning that the Pope is the successor of the Apostle Peter, Christ appointed Peter as the first Pope, who in turn went to Rome. Where is that in the Bible? Peter never went to Rome, Paul went to Rome, and served in this capacity for 25 years. From him it is claimed a succession of popes has continued to this day, a very important part of Roman Catholic doctrine. But you know, like all the Roman Catholic doctrines, they are lies. Just think of the donation of Constantine and the Pseudo-Isidorian Decretals. And when you don't understand that, well, then listen to Tom Fress. He spoke about that abundantly. And do your own research. Roman Catholic doctrine is always based on lies, because they are a lie. But, continues the author, did Christ ordain one man to be above all others in his church? Did he institute the papal office? Did he appoint Peter as the supreme pontiff? Well, according to the scriptures, Christ, quote, is the head of the church, not the pope. And we can read that in Ephesians 5 and in the verses uh, 20 through 23. Quote, of course, from the authorized 1611 King James Bible giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body." Unquote. The next picture that I will show here in the video shows the toeless toes of Peter that is located in St. Peter's at Rome. Long lines of people wait daily to pass before it and kiss its foot. <laughs> Hello? Uh, didn't the people ever hear about so-called bacteria and viruses where you get sick from when there are thousands of people in a line to kiss the Pope's, or uh, the Peter's foot every day? Can't you get sick of that? What does the World Health Organization 
let by the United Nations, by the Pope, say of that. Shouldn't they forbid that? <laughs> oh, Jörg, stop your sarcasm. <laughs> anyway, bronze statue of St. Peter. The feet have been made toeless from thousands, I would say even worse, millions touching and kissing the feet over the years. More on the toes in the next chapter. That is chapter 11 that you have to uh, wait a little bit for. And here's just a little remark that I made time and time again. The statue of Peter was taken from the Roman pantheon, where it resembled Jupiter, and after the baptizing of the Roman pagan empire itself with Christianity, what we spoke here earlier about, they transported it to St. Peter's and renamed it Peter. This fact will also be discussed in the next chapter, as the author says. James and John once came to Jesus asking if one of them might sit on his right hand and the other on his left in the kingdom. You know, in Eastern kingdoms, the two principal ministers of state, ranking next in authority to the king, hold these positions. If the Roman Catholic claim is true, it seems that Jesus would have explained he had given the place on his right to Peter, and did not intend to create any position on the left. But to the contrary, here was the answer of Jesus. Quote, From Mark chapter 10 And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldst do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant us, that we may sit one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of? and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. Yes, we can. Huh? <laughs> and Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized, with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. But so shall it not be among you. You know, because we don't wear the mark of Cain. But so shall it not be among you, says our Lord. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be the chiefest shall be the servant of all. That is biblical doctrine. That is the gospel. That is our Savior Jesus Christ talking during the 70th week of Daniel that he completely fulfilled in the seven-year ministry, three and a half years after his baptism until he got slain on the cross. This is our Lord, not the Pope speaking. And the difference is, the Lord tells the truth, incapable of lying, and the Pope tells the lie, incapable of telling the truth. So the author continues, Certainly this argues against the concept that one of them was to be a Pope, ruling all over all others in the Church as Bishop of Bishops. Jesus further taught the concept of equality by warning the disciples against the use of flattering religious titles such as Father, and the word Pope means Father, Rabbi, or even Master. For one is your Master, even Christ, he said, and all ye are brethren. 
And for that we can go to Matthew 23. And I'm going to read that to you right here. From the King James, again, and I start at verse 1, and I read through verse 12. Quote, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries, and enlarge the borders of their garments, and love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be ye not called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. End quote. But Roman Catholics are taught that Peter was given such a superior position, that the entire church was built upon him. Yes, Roman Catholics are taught that, so please, why don't Roman Catholics for once open their eyes and open their ears and do their own study in the holy book and in history? Are they too gullible? Or are they too lazy, too simple to read and understand? I don't think so. Catholics are fine people. Catholics are God-believing people. But they are taken by ignorance to believe in the wrong God without even their own knowledge. Because they believe what the Catholic hierarchy teaches them and they are not used to question. And you always have to question things. And if you don't, you just swallow everything that is taught like Peter was a superior position given by the Roman Catholic Church. So please, my dear Catholic brethren, I even call you brethren, even we are not. <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church calls us Protestants, separated brethren. But you know, I love my fellow people. I also love the betrayed ones, and I want to show them the truth, and I hope that a lot of Catholics follow this book reading and see how, that how they are betrayed. By their works you will know them, right? So don't judge a Catholic on what he says, judge him on what he does. And I'm talking about a Catholic in the Roman Catholic hierarchy. I'm not talking about the layman going to church on Sunday and thinking that he is doing the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob a good service, because he is not. But here, with this and other books that everybody can read freely on the internet or buy the book, you can learn that what the Roman Catholic Church teaches is not what the Bible teaches. So you have to make a decision, sooner or later, whether you believe some guy with a fish head, sitting in the chair in Rome, claiming to be God, or you can believe the real, true God, by getting to know His only true word, the Bible in the 1611 King James Version, preferably. 
Now the author continues, the verse that is used to support this claim, that Peter was given a superior position, is in Matthew 16, verse 18. Quote, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Unquote. Now, Listen to the explanation. If we take this verse in its setting, however, we can see that the church was not built on Peter, but on Christ. In the verses just before, Jesus asked the disciples who men were saying that he was. Some said he was John the Baptist, some said Elijah, others thought he was Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Then Jesus asked them, But whom say ye that I am? And to this Peter replied, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then it was Jesus, then, uh, then it was that Jesus said, quote, Thou art Peter, Petros, a stone, a rock. And upon this rock, Petra, a mass of rock, a great foundation, rock of truth that Peter had just expressed, I will build my church. Unquote. The true foundation upon which the church was built was Christ himself, not Peter. It is, in fact, Christ's church, not St. Peter's. <laughs> and the Roman Catholic Church says that itself because it is St. Peter's Basilica, but it is the church of the Pope meaning the church of Peter. That's what they say. So is it Peter's church or is it Christ's church? Well, I prefer Christ's church. I don't put my merit in any man, living or dead. Peter himself declared, the author continues, that Christ was the foundation rock, as we can read in 1 Peter ver uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 4 through 8. And I quote again from the King James Bible, what Peter himself declared. Quote, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Unquote. He spoke of Christ as the stone which was set at naught of you builders, neither is there salvation in any other as we can read in Acts, uh, verse one, ver, uh, Acts chapter 1, no, sorry, <laughs> Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Uh, problem with my eyes here, I think. Sorry. As we can read in Acts chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. The church was built on Christ. He is the true foundation, and there is no other foundation. There is only one foundation, because, as we can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, quote, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Unquote. When Jesus spoke of building his church upon a rock, the disciples did not take this to mean he was exalting Peter to be their Pope. For two chapters later they asked Jesus who was the greatest, as we can read in Matthew chapter 18 verse 1. If Jesus taught the church would be built on Peter, the disciples would have automatically known who was the greatest among them. Actually, it was not until the time of Calixtus, who was Bishop of Rome from 218 to 223 AD, 
that Matthew 16 verse 18 was used in an attempt to prove the church was built on Peter and that the Bishop of Rome was his successor. If we take a close look at Peter in the scriptures, it becomes apparent that he was not a pope. First, Peter was married. And by the way, for all you LBGTI guys, women, things out there, Peter, a man, was married to a woman. The way that the Bible explains and declares the only way a marriage can be. Peter was married. The fact that Peter was a married man does not harmonize with Catholic position that a Pope is to be unmarried. <laughs> of course not. The scriptures tells us that Peter's wife's mother was healed of a fever, as we can read in Matthew 18, uh, 8, verse 14 and 15. Quote, and when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother late and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto him, unto them. Unquote. Of course there couldn't be a Peter's wife's mother if Peter didn't have a wife. Even years later, Paul made a statement which shows the apostles had wives, including Cephas, as we can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5. Quote, have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? Unquote. Cephas was, was Peter's Aramaic name, as we can read in John chapter 1, verse 42. Quote, and he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Coming back to Peter, meaning a stone. Now, the second reason why it becomes clear through scripture that Peter was not a pope is the following. Peter would not allow men to bow down to him. When Peter came into his house, quote, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am a man, unquote. And for that you can go to Acts chapter 10, verses 25 and 26, and this will also be repeated in chapter 11. This was quite different from what the Pope might have said, for men do bow before the Pope and kiss his ring. Third, Peter did not place tradition on a level with the word of God. To the contrary, Peter had little faith in traditions from your fathers, as we can read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Quote, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Unquote. His sermon on the day of Pentecost was filled with the word, not traditions of men. When the people asked what they should do to get right with God, Peter did not tell them to have a little water poured and sprinkled over them. Instead he said, Quote, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Unquote. And for reference, go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And the fourth and last point, Peter was not a pope, for he wore no crown. Peter himself explained that when the chief shepherd shall appear, then shall we, quote, receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away, unquote, as we can read in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. Since Christ has not yet appeared again, the crown that the Pope wears is not one bestowed upon him by Christ. In short, Peter never acted like a Pope, never dressed like a Pope, never spoke like a Pope, never wrote like a Pope, and people did not approach him as a Pope. You know, you in America, you have a saying, if it looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it probably is a duck. <laughs> the point was just made, if it doesn't look like a duck, if it doesn't smell like a duck, it doesn't walk like a duck, it doesn't quack like a duck, it probably is not a duck. P. 
Peter is not the predecessor of the Pope's point. <laughs> in all probability, the author continues, in the very early days of the church, Peter did have the most prominent ministry among the apostles. It was Peter who preached the first sermon after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and 3,000 were added to the Lord. Later, it was Peter who first took the gospel to the Gentiles. Well, I thought that was Paul in Rome, but anyway, I'm not looking that up right now. He was at least one of the very first, right? I didn't read the complete chapter of Acts, so maybe he was the very first. Whenever we find a list of the twelve apostles in the Bible, Peter's name is always mentioned first, as we can see in Matthew 10, verse 2, Mark 3, verse 16, Luke 6, verse 14, and Acts 1, verse 13. But none of this, not by any stretch of the imagination, would indicate that Peter was the Pope or Universal Bishop of Bishops. While Peter apparently took the most outstanding role of the Apostles at the very beginning, later on Paul seems to have had the most outstanding ministry. As a writer of the New Testament, Paul wrote 100 chapters with 2,325 verses, while Peter only wrote 8 chapters with 166 verses. Paul spoke of Peter, James and John as pillars in the church as we can read in Galatians 2, verse 9, quote, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Unquote. Nevertheless, he could say, quote, In nothing am I behind the very chiefest, of chiefest apostles. Unquote, as we can read in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 11. But if Peter was the supreme pontiff, the Pope, then certainly Paul would have been somewhat behind him. Don't you think? On one occasion, Paul even gave a rebuke to Peter, quote, because he was to be blamed, as we can read in Galatians 2, verse 11. This is strange wording if Peter was regarded as an, quote, unquote, infallible Pope. Isn't it? Yeah, probably is. Paul was called the Apostle of the Gentiles, as we can read in Romans, uh, what is there? Romans 11, verse 13. Uh, I have to write, open up the right note here. Quote, For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the Apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Uh, he doesn't magnify himself, like the Catholics do, but he magnifies his office. Whereas Peter's ministry was primarily to the Jews, as we can read in Galatians 2, verses 7 through 9. Quote, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave unto me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. Unquote. This fact, in itself, would seem sufficient. <laughs> I think everything we read so far would be sufficient to show that Peter was not the Bishop of Rome, for Rome was a Gentile city. All of this is indeed highly significant when we consider that the entire framework of Roman Catholicism is based on the claim that Peter was Rome's first bishop. There is no proof, biblically speaking, says the author, and I have to interject here, but biblically speaking, that's the only speech that counts. There is no proof, biblically speaking, that Peter ever went near Rome. We read about his trip to Antioch, Samaria, Joppa, Caesarea and other places, but not Rome. This is a strange omission, especially since Rome was considered the most important city in the world. Now, another excerpt from the Catholic Encyclopedia when you read the article Peter, 
I told you before, this is what I love about the Antichrist system, they even write it in their own writings, in their own encyclopedias. The article states in the Catholic Encyclopedia that points out that the tradition appeared as early as the 3rd century for the belief that Peter was Bishop of Rome for 25 years, these years being, as Jerome believed, from 42 AD until 67 AD. But this viewpoint is not without distinct problems. Why? About the year 44, Peter was in the council at Jerusalem, as we can read in Acts 15. About 53 AD, Paul joined him in Antioch, as we can read in Galatians 2.11. About 58 AD, Paul wrote his letter to the Christians at Rome, in which he sent greetings to 27 persons, but never mentioned Peter. <laughs> Imagine a missionary writing to a church, greeting 27 of the members by name, but never mentioning the pastor. <laughs> The keys in the picture to the right, so the picture that I show you here in the video right now, are supposed to represent the keys of the kingdom that was given to Peter in Matthew 16, verse 19. According to Roman Catholicism, these keys represent all authority in heaven and in earth, and she, meaning Roman Catholicism, as the quote-unquote rightful possessor, through the passing of those keys, has all authority. Pope Gregory VII, the only pope to canonize himself, by the way, drew up a dictatus, meaning a list of 27 theses outlining his powers as Peter's vicar, prince of the apostles, and chief shepherd. It is Catholic doctrine that by changing Simon's name to Peter was making him the first pope and had of the Roman Catholic Church, as well as establishing apostolic succession. Catholic popes would be given these keys of Peter to reign as Pontifex Maximus in Rome, a title held by the Caesars of Rome as well. So this already finishes chapter 10. I told you it was not so long, so we are about 40 minutes in there, but I have to make a little comment on the last uh, two sentences. <clears throat> it is Catholic doctrine, <clears throat> the author said, that by changing Simon's name to Peter was making him the first pope and the head of the Roman Catholic Church as well as establishing apostolic succession. Now, <laughs> if you want to know about apostolic succession, there's a video that I'm going to upload. I really have to think about that and make work of that. That is in the archives that I found from Tom Fress. When he was reading the book from Dave Hunt, A Woman Rides the Beast. I made already two videos, I think, of those readings. Uh, I think they're on my second channel, Joggler's War on Disinfo. You can look that up. Um, they are called about something about Mary and uh, I think uh, the um, uh, donation of Constantine. And he also did one where Dave Hunt was <laughs> writing about the so-called apostolic succession, telling the people, teaching the people how the popes fought, how the one killed the other, how they bribed each other and bribed the people to get the post of pope. And when you read that, you can really stand next to it and laugh and laugh and laugh when the pope claims that he has, quote-unquote, apostolic succession. There is no apostolic succession. There never was, there never will be. Certainly not for the wicker of Christ on earth, because there's only one wicker of Christ on earth. And who is that? The Holy Ghost. The Comforter that could only come when Jesus left this world. The Holy Spirit is the Comforter. The Holy Spirit is the place taker, the replacement of Christ in this world right now. I didn't want to say, quote unquote, Vicarius Filii Dei, because that's a Roman title, a Latin title, and I don't want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit by giving him a Latin title. 
But the Pope claims to be Vicarius Filidei. He claims to be the successor of Christ. So he claims to be the Holy Ghost too. Because Christ clearly said, When I leave, I send you the Comforter, and he will teach you all things. Well, the Pope thinks that he teaches us all things. The Pope thinks that he has apostolic succession. The Pope thinks that he is the successor of Peter. What have we learned in this little chapter right now? The Pope doesn't speak much truth, eh? Okay, I'm going to leave it here. That was chapter 10, and I will continue the next time with chapter 11. That is called Pagan Origin of Papal Office. Chapter 11 from Babylon Mystery Religion from Ralph Woodrow. And until then, do your own research. Thank you very much for watching the video and listening to my sometimes probably annoying voice. But I am in such a good mood, I had to share this and do this while reading today. Until next time, do your own research. I love you all. God bless you and keep you in his ways. Until then, Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off. God bless you and bye-bye.